Hey guys, I'm Devin. And I'm Andy. And welcome back to False, False Pretenses. Pretenses. Today we're going to be talking about one of the greatest con men in American history, and in, honestly, world history. We're talking about a guy who sold the Eiffel Tower not once, but twice, what? despite never owning it. We're talking about Count Victor Lustig. While he's not a true count, though, he did present himself as a very noble person dignified, reserved man. And honestly, after reading through this story, I kind of respect him a bit. Okay, yeah, let's get into it. I'm ready. Let's go. Count Victor Lustig was once America's most dangerous con man. While he told prison officials later in life that he was born in Austria-Hungarian town of Pustien in January 4th, 1890, there's a plot twist. A historian began a tireless search for biographical information about his town's most famous citizen. He searched through records rescued from Nazi bonfires, pored over electoral rolls and historical documents. He must have attended school in Hostien, yet he is not even mentioned in the list of pupils attending the local primary school. After much searching, there is not a scrap of evidence that Lustig was ever even born. Due to this, we may never know the true identity of Count Victor Lustig. This is further exacerbated by his lifestyle. We have been able to account for up to 47 different aliases and dozens of fake passports. Honestly, you would need a machete to cut your way through this. Wow, I, I mean, I can't even imagine living one double life, let alone at least 47. Could you imagine having to respond to that many different names? Could not be me. How do you remember? To add to the deception, Lustig never told the same story twice about his background. Sometimes, he would tell people that he had grown up and his father Ludwig was the mayor of the town. At other times, he would describe his childhood as bleak and that they were the poorest of peasant people who raised him in a grim house made of stone. He also claimed that he only stole to survive, but only from the greedy and the dishonest. It sounds like a bit of narcissism having to paint himself in the in the good light, you yeah. know what I mean? You gotta build up those excuses in your brain so that doing feels okay. If you tell people more and more, you may even begin to believe your own lies. Yes. That's the way. His early life was spent in all matters of petty crime. In the early 1900s, as a teenager, Lustig scampered up the criminal ladder, progressing from panhandler to pickpocket to burglar to street hustler. According to the True Detective Mysteries magazine, he perfected every card trick ever known. By the time he reached adulthood, Lustig could make a deck of cards do everything but talk. His first true victims were first-class passengers aboard transatlantic ships. The newly rich were easy pickings. This led him to America, and he arrived at the end of the First World War during the Roaring Twenties. America, in the 1920s, was infested with confidence rackets, operated by smooth-talking immigrants like Charles Ponzi. If you have not watched our video on Charles Ponzi, go ahead and check out that video right here. Good one. Narrated by yours truly. This is where he began his most successful scam, the Romanian money box. This was a small wooden box fashioned from cedar with complicated rollers and brass dials. Lustig claimed the contraption could copy banknotes using an element called radium. So he was just selling an item that, in theory, printed. Yes. And they just bought it? Yes. Damn. The 20s is crazy. Poverty is it's different. <laughs> Lustig's repertoire also included fake horse race schemes, vain seizures during business meetings, and bogus real estate investments. These cappers made him a public enemy and a millionaire. However, none of these held a candle to his greatest con of selling the Eiffel Tower. And so when he sold the Eiffel Tower, I'm assuming he did not own it? No. Okay, well how? Let's find out. Okay. <laughs> in May of 25, he arrived in Paris, France. Once he arrived, he commissioned stationery carrying official French government seal. He then presented himself at the front desk of the Hotel de Crillon, a stone palace on the Place de la Concorde. From here, while pretending to be a French government official, Lustig wrote to the top people of the French scrap metal industry and invited them all to a meeting. He's quoted to have said, because of engineering faults, costly repairs, and political problems, the tearing down of the Eiffel Tower has become mandatory, and that the tower would be sold to the highest bidder. They went nuts, and the bids 
flew in and he did this con not once but twice bro um i'm gonna be honest french doesn't have the best history no nope. normally they're out here waving the white flag which just adds to the list of questionable calls that they've made that's a tough look france wee oui, wee oui. Twice. Indeed. Lustig was able to be so convincing because he had come up and taught himself the following 10 commandments. Number one, be a patient listener. It is this, not fast talking, that gets a con man his coup. Number two, never look bored. Number three, wait for the other person to reveal any political opinions and then agree with them. Number four, let the other person reveal religious views and have the same ones. Number five, hint at sex talk, but don't follow it up unless the other fellow shows a strong interest. Pause. Number six, never discuss illness unless some special concern is shown. Seven, never pry into a person's personal circumstances because they'll tell you all eventually. Eight, never boast, just let your importance be quietly obvious. Number nine, never be untidy. And finally, number 10, an important one, never be drunk. That's uh, honestly a pretty good list for right? the most part. I would see him in a manipulative, but... If you want to be agreeable, oh yeah. Yeah, but I will say that um, number 10, I want to work in my life. Couldn't be you. <laughs> Could not be. <laughs> However, like many of the individuals we have discussed, it was greed that finally led to Lustig's demise. His friend invited him to his house and he straight up stole $16,000 from him. Obviously, his friend reported the crime. This led to the police being on his trail, but he did not quit conning. This led him actually to begin a counterfeit banknote business in 1930. These notes were considered to be flawless and fooled many bank tellers. In fact, he purposefully only printed $100 bills because he knew that these were the most scrutinized banknotes. These notes were so convincing, it was feared that the fake notes could shake international confidence in the dollar. Lustig was finally arrested on May 10th, 1935, but then quickly escaped, getting out of his cell the Sunday before Labor Day. He left his jailers a handwritten note from which he quoted Les Miserables. He allowed himself to be led in a promise. Jean Valjean had his promise, even to a convict, especially to a convict. It may give the convict confidence and guide him on the right path. Law was not made by God, and man can be wrong. I love that quote from him, man. Like, listen, con man, scummy, absolutely, but I fuck a little bit. Is he wrong? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> he firmly believes he is not in the wrong. He evaded the law until September 28, 1935, where he was involved in a nine-block car chase, and when finally apprehended, said to the police, Well, boys, here I am. Before his sentencing, the judge said, Count, you're the smoothest con man that has ever lived. He then sentenced him to 20 years in Alcatraz. However, the cold weather quickly took a toll on his body, and he made a staggering 1,192 requests to go to the medical center and filled 507 prescriptions. Due to his history though, the guards thought that this was all just a ruse and did not believe him that there were any problems. Eventually, they transferred him to a secure medical center in Springfield, Missouri, where doctors realized he actually was not faking. While in Missouri, he died from complications arising from pneumonia. Could you imagine being so good at conning people that people refuse to believe you're sick? After 1,192 medical requests. I mean, boy who cried wolf, bro. That's a double-edged sword. It is a double-edged sword. If you've made it this far in the video and you liked it, hit that like button and be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so that you are notified. Those likes and comments really get us going. I love them. We appreciate every single one of you. Thank you guys so much for watching. That's us at False Pretenses. We'll catch you next time. That dude was honestly like spirited. Honestly, like I kind of fucked with him, even though he was a little bit of a dick. I mean, imagine selling the Eiffel Tower twice.